Titus chapter 2. Um, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, you see the word appeared. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared. In verse 13, it says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God. And then in chapter 3, verse 4, it says, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. And so what we did was last Sunday night, we started talking about things that appear and disappear. And yes, we are eventually going to get to the verses that we're looking at. Um, but it is interesting in the Word of God, um, the, the things that appear. To appear means to suddenly be in view. Um, it was there all along, but you never saw it. And then it just became visible. It means to become obvious. And uh, the Lord makes things appear, and He makes things disappear. And uh, we talked about several of those things. We started off with the thought of some things the Lord makes disappear. And we're going to look at a couple more of those tonight. And, uh, and then um, uh, if we have time, we'll, we'll shift into things that appear. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being in this room. Thank you, Lord, that um, uh, Joe Yusiko uh, always arranges this. And, um, and God, by your grace, uh, we've never had to pay for this. We thank you for that. And uh, God, thank you for what we've enjoyed already. And um, now, Lord, help us and speak to us. And Lord, make it peculiarly applicable, Lord. And we pray that um, you would do your sweet work, Lord, in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And um, this chapter opens up and it says uh, in verse 5, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Um, I just want to say something real quick. Um, uh, Mrs. Idsinga just stepped out, but what she doesn't realize is that door is going to be locked. So um, if I could get one of you young guys, Jack, maybe if I could get you just to just to step out in the hall just for a minute, because when she comes back in, if you could let her in those doors, it will just be simpler. Um, what's that? Oh, I guess it'll be a while. Um in verse 5, it gives that list. And beside all this, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. You know, there's a process there, and you know, you don't add it all at once. Um, but, it, you know, it's, there's a starting point, and, and um, that's the way the Christian life is. It seems like that all along the way, um, there's things that we're working on. And, uh, and that is, as it should be, that's all part of growth. It doesn't matter where you're at in the Christian life. There will never be a point where you stop growing. And, uh, but it does say, if, verse 9, but he that lacketh these things, oh, verse 8, but for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You know, one of the things that can disappear is your memory. And I, I'm not talking about, you know, um, uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, in spiritual things. Remember the children of Israel? You know, they're in bondage for 400 and some years. And man, by the grace of God, one day they cross through the Red Sea. And uh, man, it's wonderful. Their days of bondage are done. And uh, God brings them and starts them on that journey towards the promised land. But you know, they, they get a little ways into that journey. They actually were in the wilderness for about a year. Okay, And that first year was by God's own doing. Uh, the next 40 were not. But that first year was by the, um, that was God's will. And uh, God took them along the, the long way around because he said he didn't want them to see war lest they would be discouraged. So he takes them through the wilderness, and along the way they hit a place where they're thirsty and there's no water, and, and, and then there's, there's complaints about the food, and, and, and they make a couple really dumb statements to God. They said, we remember the leeks and the garlics and the onions, and, 
And in other words, we remember how good we had it in Egypt. And the fact was, it wasn't good in Egypt. It was terrible in Egypt. It says, Pharaoh made them serve with rigor and hard bondage so much that every day of their life they were groaning and their groaning was what caught God's attention. It had been a terrible life. But you know what happened? Somehow their memory disappeared. They forgot. We talked a little bit about that this morning. Look at Hebrews 12. You just back up just a, a few pages to your left. You'll see 1 Peter and James and go to Hebrews, Hebrews 12. In Hebrews 12, he starts off the chapter by telling them to... Uh, uh, lay aside the sin that so easily besets them and lay aside every weight and, um, and to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of their faith. Verse 3, For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself. Boy, it's always good in your difficulty. It's always good, period, to remember the Lord. If you're having a good day, if you're having a bad day, if you feel spiritual, if you don't feel spiritual, it's always a good thing. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, My son... Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of Him. For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. He reminds them of something they had forgotten. And it was an Old Testament thought. It shows up in Proverbs chapter 3. He says, you, you've forgotten that, you know, the Lord introduces chastening into your life to correct you and uh, he's the best of fathers. He'll never overdo it. You know, he said earthly fathers sometimes did it just for their own pleasure. But he said, but the Lord's not like that. When he steps in, when he begins to send grief into your life to make you stop and think and search your heart, you know, he's doing it because he's just trying to help you. And he said, you have forgotten. You've forgotten that the Lord chastens his children. Look at Matthew 16. You know, sometimes, you know, all sorts of trouble break out, may break out in your life. And of course, it's not always this way, you know. It, sometimes it's for other reasons. But it would be a good thing to stop and think and say, is the Lord trying to get my attention here? Because He does do that. He does do that. Matthew 16, verse 5. And when His disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. They, they totally misunderstood what the Lord was getting at. Verse 8, which when Jesus perceived, He said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up, neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Notice what he says in verse 9. Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000? He said, don't you remember? And if you read the other accounts, um, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 7,000 had literally just occurred. Look at uh, Mark chapter 6. 
Jesus comes to them in the middle of the night when they're on the stormy sea. In verse 49 of Mark chapter 6, But when they saw Him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw Him and were troubled. And immediately He talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And He went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. You know, they had just seen uh, two amazing miracles. You know, sometimes your memory disappears, you know. And I mean, we're all like this. Um, and that's why many times in the Scriptures, it's, it's actually a good idea to, to look up the word remember and just go to every place where that word shows up. Because the Lord many times said, remember this. You know, and, and the thought is that you call it to mind on purpose. You purposely remember. Um, you know, these guys had just seen the Lord do uh, two outstanding, unbelievable miracles. But they had forgotten these recent miracles. And you know, sometimes um, we're like that. You know, I don't know how it is for you in your, in your recent history in the last few months, but I know there are several of you in this room that even in the last six months, there's some amazing things the Lord has done for you. They're personal things. Uh, you've seen some real amazing blessings uh, that only the Lord could do. You have prayed for some very specific things, and the Lord has very specifically answered you. And I guess it, it is encouraging, you know, that even the disciples who walked with the Lord and saw these two great miracles, they uh, how quickly they forgot. But the next time that, you know, you find yourself, you know, really questioning what God's doing and, and uh, you know, you're sort of bummed out and, and, you know, you feel like the Lord's a million miles away, it might be good and stop and ask yourself, you know, what has the Lord done for me in the last six months? And, and again, that's one of those blessings of keeping some sort of a prayer journal. You know, you, you will always remember all the bad things. That's just, just the way we are. We never forget those. But, um, but you ought to record some of those things that you pray for, the real specific things, and then God answers them. You ought to write those down. And then every once in a while, you ought to open that thing up and just look at all the things. Some big, some small, some really tiny, but they were very specific and very personal. And God answered you. Sometimes our memory disappears and it gets us in trouble. Look at Isaiah 65. There are things that appear and things that disappear. Sometimes our memory disappears. Now, there will be a day when it looks like most of our memory will disappear and it will be a wonderful thing. Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former, that's the old earth, that's the one we're living on, shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Lord said, there is coming a day, you know, when we're out of here and there's that new heaven and the new earth, and there will be a day out there somewhere. You know, we, there will be the judgment seat of Christ and our life will be reviewed and all that. But there is a day coming when all that will no longer be remembered. In Revelation 21, you know, it talks about uh, the new heaven and the, the new earth and and there was no more sorrow, nor death, nor pain. And, and it says, for the former things are passed away. And behold, he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. 
Will we remember? Some people, you know, ask this question. Will we remember the pains of this life? Will we remember the struggles and the heartaches and the dark days? And, you know, there is no night there. Will we remember? Look at Romans 8. Romans 8. Boy, do you ever have things in your mind that you wish you could forget? I'm sure some of you do. I've got things that I remember from 20-some years ago, and every time I think about them, I still cringe. Romans 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, even if, even if you could remember this life, would it, would it be worth remembering? You know, a lot, of, a, lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff that haunts you, you know, a, a lot of the things, you know, there's just, there's, you know, really what robs a lot of people of their joy is oftentimes they're reminded of something and they judge the present by something that they remember or they're judged because of something somebody else remembers. And it robs, it robs people of a lot, good people, God's people, it robs them of a lot of joy. But will we remember it there? Would it even be worth remembering? Look at John 16. John 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Can you imagine how vivid your memory would be there? You know, right now, and some of you, you know, you're young, and you know, you're, you're, you're 30 and under, and you know, your memory is still pretty vivid. And, you know, some of us, it doesn't quite work that way. And... Um, you know, we, we, we struggle to remember people's names. And, and then I hear people tell stories, uh, some of my relatives, and I'll go, that didn't happen like that. But they sure think it did. So one of us is losing our mind. I'm not sure who. But you know, the memory gets foggy and the stories get changed. And, and, but can you imagine when we see Him, it says, we shall be like Him. You know what that means? That's good and bad. The bad side is, if we remember it like he remembers it, we're going to remember everything. I don't know that that's a good idea. I don't think he thinks it's a good idea either. Look at John 16. John 16, verse 21. John 16, verse 21. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow. She's in childbirth because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy. Hey, you know what happens when we step into the other world? He says, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. For a lot of those dark memories from the past, they would cast a shadow on our joy. But he's not going to let that happen. Verse 21. For joy that a man is born into the world, and ye know, and ye, and ye now, now therefore have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. You know, there's some things that disappear. And sometimes, you know, our memory disappears. And it's, it's really, in this life, it's things we ought to remember. Things about the Lord, things we've learned, blessings He's given, all the times He's delivered us, all the things He's brought us through. You know, uh, we, need, we need to remember that. And, but if you're not careful, you'll forget that. You know, I, I've watched people, I've known people, you guys have heard me tell stories, you guys have your own stories, of people that used to walk with the Lord. There was a day when they were in church and they were excited about the Lord, and they're not there now. And God says, you know what their problem is? They have forgotten that they were purged 
from their old sins. Man, their memory disappeared. But on the good side of that coin is that one day the Lord will take care of all the memories that we will no longer need to remember. And it'll be good there. We'll be thankful that those memories disappear. Go to Acts 27 and we'll look at another thing that sometimes disappears. Acts 27, verse 13. Acts 27, verse 13. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind. That means it was a violent, violent over-the-top storm. A tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. That's, that's a desperate move. They were in a terrible strait. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. You know what happened there? Hope disappeared. They reached a point in that voyage where for many days, it says, they didn't see the sun, they didn't see the moon, they didn't see the stars. And you know, after a day or two, they probably thought, well, you know, let's just hang on. This can't go on forever. You know, sometimes people get in a bad situation and they try to be real positive. You know, and that's a good thing. That's it sure beats being negative. But you know, they try to be real positive, you know. And you know, well, we'll just hang in there. You know, cheer up, it could get worse. And so they cheered up and it got worse. And you know, they think, well, this can't go on forever. But, you know, sometimes people wind up in a situation where it just goes on and on and on. And the Bible says that all hope was taken away. Boy, it is a terrible thing to lose hope. Their hope disappeared. But then a wonderful thing happened. Then the Lord appeared. Look at verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Can you imagine? You picture, you know, what, what's going on here. You know, the sun hasn't started shining. The storm hasn't died down. I don't even know where he's having this meeting. They're probably, they're probably in these ships. I've, I've read stories about these ships and about these storms. Um, one of the things that led to John Wesley's salvation, and John Wesley was 1,500 years after this. John Wesley said he, they got caught in a storm at sea. And, you know, it was those great big big old you know, ships like the pirate ships, you know, with the big sail. They got, he, they got caught in a storm, and the sea started coming in. And he said, people were down below. The ocean waves were washing in. They were washing into the boat. People were screaming. People were hanging on because the boat's doing this and it's doing this and water's coming in. And that's, that's, that's where Paul's having this meeting. He's hanging on and they're hanging on. He says, be of good cheer. And, he's, and the thing is going crazy. This is not a calm meeting around the table. Verse 22. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, I'm God's, on whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, 
Thou must be brought before Caesar. He says, Paul, you're going to make it. And lo, the icing on the cake, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. You know, um, all hope was gone. The hope had disappeared. But you know what made all the difference when, there, when the hope was gone? Was that the Lord appeared. The Lord appeared. Go to Mark 6. We were there just a moment ago. Mark chapter 6. You know, you might be in a situation that just looks hopeless. And, um, and you know, you do all you can to fix it. You know, the Lord expects you to do what you can, you know. Um, but when, when hope has disappeared, the only thing that's going to change that. You know what you need to do? You just need to get alone somewhere. Maybe you need to fast. But you need to get alone and you need to call on the Lord and say, Lord... I need you to make an appearance. Because if you make an appearance, I know it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Look at Mark 6, verse 44. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. So he's up in the mountain, he's praying, and they've been rowing, and uh, man, they're, they're out in the middle of the sea, and, and they're not getting anywhere, and the sea is getting rough. But it's interesting, in verse 48, it says, He saw them. He saw them getting nowhere. He saw them doing the best they could do. They were toiling. They were going at His command. And he sa- it says he saw them. And it says in verse 48, he cometh unto them. You know what he did in that storm, you see? He made his appearance. And suddenly that stormy sea became calm. It says that the Lord ruleth the raging of the sea. You know what made all the difference was when the Lord appeared. There's things that disappear. And there's things that appear. Of course, it's always a wonderful thing when the Lord appears. I want you to go with me to Revelation 3 and we'll talk about another thing that will appear. This next one is an interesting thought, and you'll you'll hardly ever, I don't know, maybe, maybe you have, but I've hardly ever heard anybody ever comment on this. The Lord is writing to the church at, at, at Laodicea, and in verse 17, Revelation 3, verse 17, it says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, And, now watch the word, naked. Naked. I counsel thee, the Lord says. The Lord says, I got a piece of advice for you. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Appear. It is a strange thing. The Lord counsels the church at Laodicea to change their thinking and to revalue what they consider valuable and to push out of their comfort zone and to be zealous towards the Lord again. And He says, so you can get some 
gold and silver and precious stones. You can get some rewards. And he said also that you might get raiment that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. You know, there's some, there's some things um, that in the Bible it, it talks about, you know, when we get on the other side and when we meet the Lord and, and how we're going to stand before the Lord. And there's more than one reference to, to all of a sudden we stand there in front of the Lord, but it, it doesn't look like everybody's going to look the same. It looks like there's some people that are going to appear before him with the wrong garment on or with a garment that there, there's a garment that they should have and it's missing. I, I don't think it means, and, and um, I, I, I think you'll agree, I don't think it means that you're going to be standing there, you know, stark naked in front of the Lord. I, I don't think it means that. You know, um, you know, there's a lady will be, you know, getting ready for go to town, you know, and, and she'll forget her earrings and, and she'll say, um, Oh, you know, I, I, I realized I forgot my earrings. I just, I just feel naked without my earrings, you know, or I, or I, I forgot this or, um, you know, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever left you, you men, if you've ever, uh, you probably not, but boy, there's the odd time where you've left and, and you left, you didn't have your belt on. You were in a hurry. Something happened. You had to get out the door and, and you you forgot something. You forgot something. I'll never forget uh, in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, my pastor there, one of our guys, um, really, it was a great thing. Uh, he arranged a hayride and it was in the wintertime. And we were talking about this with somebody the, the other day. And, uh, you know, it was wonderful. He had a friend that had horses and uh, man, it was going to be, you know, just a real live hayride sled thing and, and the hay and all that. And um, the only problem was it was minus 35 that night. And uh, everybody knew that. And a bunch of them, uh, we, we all went there. And I don't know what happened. I don't know where my brain was. Um, but I, I had all the right clothes on except for my shoes. And I had my running shoes on. Need I tell you, I didn't enjoy that ride past about the first two minutes. And I thought my feet were going to freeze off. I was in agony the whole hayride. You know what I was missing? An article of clothing. The, the, um, the, the idea here and what the Lord is stressing is, that there is this there is this nakedness and it produces shame that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear there is an author and I can't think of her name right now and we have a couple of her books and um and I, I've never read the books but she she's her specialty she she's a lost woman and she talks about shame in our world you know how people suffer suffer from shame, and and um, she probably deals with you know good shame and bad shame and all that. But you know the the Bible says, and the Bible warns us about being ashamed before Him at His coming, being ashamed. And there's something about this garment thing, being ashamed. Years ago, um, when I was, I don't know, I was in my late 20s, we had attended a church in Pennsylvania, and uh, the church had the main floor, and they had a basement area, and it was summertime, and something was going on. And I got there early, and me and one of the other guys, and um, he asked me to help him carry the air conditioner down the stairs. Now, it was an air conditioner unit, but it was a big window unit, okay? You got the little ones, and then you got these big ones, and it was a big one. So it was a two-man carry, and uh, we start down the stairs, and I'm coming down the stairs, and I'm sort of squatting with all this weight, and I heard this, and I had blown the whole seat out of my dress pants. 
So nobody was at church yet. So we get the air conditioner in place and he loans me his jacket and I tie it around my waist and I went to my seat and I stayed seated. And, um, and you know, word got out that I had blown out the seat of my pants as only, only church people and friends can point that out. And, um, and one of the guys said, they, it, this was a church where they actually took an offering. You know, we do the offering box, but you know, some churches pass the plate and they'll always call two or three or four guys up to help take the offering. And, and the song leader said, and Brother Joe, would you come help us take the offering? <laughs> and we all laughed. But had I had to walk in front of people, I would have been, it would have been a shameful thing. When you talk about this, it seems like a little thing. You think, okay, I'm going to stand. Here, here's how carnal people think. You ready? I trust you don't think like this. But people think, oh, what's the big deal? If I, if I don't have the right garment on, and so I'm embarrassed for a few minutes in front of the Lord, you know, like, surely it could be a whole lot worse. You know, just being embarrassed. You know, I don't think we understand the ramifications of what the Lord is saying. You know, there's some things that on that day, uh, they're going to be more important to you than your house and your mortgage and, you know, all your accomplishments and all the honor that you ever received. You know, uh, they're going to be a really, really, really big deal. A really big deal. And you know what shame is? It's that thing where, where you know, um, you, you really could have done better, you know. You, and, but, you know, you didn't try. Or you, you sort of did a half job because you thought nobody would notice or whatever. And can you imagine, we will, uh, we will one day um, stand in front of the Lord. And the issue is not, did you do what somebody else did? That's never the issue. We don't, we don't compare ourselves among ourselves. We're not, you know, I can't do what you can do. You can't do what I can do. And some people do a lot outwardly. Some people do things, you know, good things. Uh, that nobody ever knows about. And there's there's a whole spectrum of things there. Some people don't have the strength to do much. Some people don't have the health to do much, while others have great strength and great ability. And so the Lord takes all that into consideration. But you know, we're going to be in heaven with some people. And um, you know what they did? They, uh, they really, they did their best. They did their best. You know what? Uh, the Lord's going to look at you and He doesn't expect you to do more than you could have done. That's unreasonable. Our Lord is not unreasonable. He is very gracious. And I think His rewards even will be very gracious. He's just good. He's just good. But you know when you stand in front of Him, you know what will be evident by the garment that I have on, the gar there'll be something about that garment that says, I didn't try too hard. While this person over here, their garment says, Lord, I did my best. And if you're over here with this garment that says, I really didn't do much, and I really didn't try. And I could have done way more, but I was way too busy messing around with all the stuff down here. I was way too preoccupied. And the Lord's going to look, and you're going to look at Him, and He's going to look at you. You know what? It's going to be a big deal then. And the reason it's a big deal is because there's no chance to go back. It's done. It's done. God says, you know what you don't want to appear? Is the shame of your nakedness. He's talking to Christians there. Yeah, he talks to the lost people and he's got that parable about the wedding garment and the person that shows up and he doesn't have the wedding garment on, which is the picture of the person that's ready to, you know, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb and, and the bride of Christ. And if you're saved, you're part of the bride and and, and you get to go to the wedding and He provides the garment. And the wedding garment thing is, in that parable, it's not that the person shows not, to, it, it's not that the Lord didn't provide it. Because in those days, when you got invited to a wedding, the person that invited you provided the garment. And our Lord has provided the garment. And the picture is, they didn't want what He provided. 
And he says, bind them hand and foot and throw them into outer darkness. Why? Wrong garment. Wrong garment. Make sure, we need to make sure that we're conscious of this. Because, you know, the way we live our life is, so, maybe you're not like this, but I find there's a thousand distractions. And if you're not careful, you give so little thought and so little effort to doing your best for Him. Because you're going to heaven anyway, right? Does it matter? All of a sudden you land on the other side and you go, oh, oh. It's too late. Let's look at another one. Look at Matthew 28. This will be the last one tonight. Matthew 28. Things that appear. Matthew 28, verse 1. It says, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Look at Luke 24. Luke 24, verse 1. Luke 24, verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here but is risen. You know, one thing that sometimes appears is angels sometimes appear. Look at Acts 27. Acts 27. We just read this verse, but I want to read it again. Acts 27, verse 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God. Go to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, they came to the iron gate that leadeth into the city which opened them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Would you look at one more verse with me? Look at Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. Hebrews 13, verse 2. Hebrews 13, verse 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. He said, you know, sometimes he was writing to the early church and he said, you know, um, he said there may be somebody that comes to your house and, you know, in the name of the Lord. And, and, um, and of course, you got to remember it was, you know, very, uh, 
maybe perhaps a lot different than, than us in some ways. And yet, um, uh, you know, there was no phone, there was, there was no texting, there was no, you know, everything was sudden. If your neighbor, if your, if your relative was going to come and see you, you know, unless they sent some piece of mail way ahead of them, you know, they just showed up at your door. Okay, so they, they, that was not unusual for somebody just to show up at your door. And he says, uh, he says here in, in Hebrews 13, he says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For some have entertained angels unawares. We were at that meeting in Montreal, and uh, Brother Brandon Lake was there, and um, he's the guy that will be preaching for us again in September, God willing. And he told the story. I can't remember if he told it when he was preaching or if he told it when we were having a private conversation. I can't remember. But he said uh, several years ago at his church, they were having a mission offering and they were trying to raise some money uh, for some mission project. They were trying to raise about $15,000. And, uh, you know, they only had about 40 or 50 people. And, of course, in every church when you've got that, you know, several of those are going to be kids. He said, so we didn't have a ton of people. And so we were, we were trying to even make it sort of fun. And uh, so we had an auction. It was actually a junk auction. And uh, he said, people knew, you know, we were going to do this. And so they came to church and people were auctioning off their, their junk. And uh, our goal was to raise about $15,000 for some, you know, mission project overseas somewhere. He said, um, you know, the service began and, and we were, you know, trying to raise that money. And, um, and he said, two men came in that night to the church. Now, this is in... Podunk, Nova Scotia. This isn't in Edmonton with 1.5 million people. You know, a lot of those little towns over there are very small. Joey Ring, who preached for us last year, will be here this year again, Lord willing. In his town, there's 300 people. Okay? So this is small town, Nova Scotia. He said that night, two strangers came in. He said nobody recognized them. And he said they bid on a couple of things and they threw in a check that night for a large amount of money. He said, you know, you know, some of you have seen checks like this. Now, now these young people, a lot of them, they don't hardly know what a check is. But, um, but you know, they, they still do use those things. You know, we, as a church, we still use them. And he said, uh, and I've seen this, where you'll get a check from somebody, but there is no personal information in the top left-hand corner. And he said, we got this check, and it was for a large amount. And he said, but there was no name. There was no address in that upper left-hand corner. And he said, so the service went on, we got all done, and by God's grace and that large contribution that they made with that check, uh, we were able to reach our goal. But he said, but there was no way to know who they were and no way to contact them. He said, I made a mental note thinking I want to catch these guys after the service. But he said, after the service, they were gone. And he said, uh, you know, the next day or two, he says, I was out and about in our little town. And he said, I began to ask questions. He said, and you know, in those little towns, everybody notices everything. And every stranger is the talk of the town. And he said, I began to ask, is there any strangers in town? So we had two guys at the church last night and nobody knew him. And he said, nobody seemed to know anything. And he said, to this day, I wonder. And you say, oh, pastor, that was probably just coincidence. Well, maybe. Except I know another story. And it was of the church that we attended years ago in Pennsylvania. And it was before we attended it. We were young, we were in our 20s, and, but before we ever got there, when we got there, they already had a nice building. They had a you know, three or four acre plot of land, and they built their, their building, and the building would seat, oh, about 120 people, and it was in a rural town, and, um, and the building had a basement of, in that area. It was very common to build basements under all these buildings, and they had their Sunday school rooms in the basement. And one day, the pastor was talking, and he told the story of what had happened on one particular evening. 
He said we had begun to build the building and we were trying to build it as we had the money and uh, we didn't want to go into debt. And he said um, we had gotten to the place where we had the basement built and we had a roof just over the basement. No, no upper floor, just a temporary makeshift roof over the basement so that we could meet in the basement. We had met there for a while and we, uh, we decided that we were going to do the same thing. We were going to try to raise some money one night and we, we let the people know well in advance, you know, we're going to take up a big offering, you know, try to give as sacrificially as you can. And uh, so the big night came and um, they started taking the offering and lo and behold, a stranger walked in. Nobody knew the stranger. Nobody ever saw him. He never came back. He had no connection to anybody in the room. And he never came back again. But that night, he jumped in the offering with a big contribution. You know, uh, you know the Bible is just as true today as it was 2,000 years ago. And the Lord said, you read all the rest of Hebrews and you take it for yourself. Uh, why not take this too? The Lord said, uh, by the way, don't forget to entertain strangers. He said occasionally. He said there may be an angel. I, I've wondered sometimes, I've wondered if God doesn't still do that today in various ways. You know, uh, wouldn't it be something to get to heaven someday and find out that we had an angel in regular attendance. And you're thinking, who would it be? And you're thinking, nobody in here. Wouldn't it be wild? You know, whenever an angel showed up, uh, in, in this context, the Lord says, be not forgetful. The, 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 the implication is, you'll have no idea. I have a friend that, uh, that one day somebody showed up at his door asking for food. And uh, actually, actually, he said he, he came to the door and he asked for a glass of milk. It was a hot day. It was in Florida. And uh, this guy came to his door and he was a saved guy, loved the Lord. And he uh, uh, really, with no thought of this, he invited the guy in. And he said, the guy looked respectable. He looked decent, you know, and he brought him in the house and he sat him down. They started talking and he got him a glass of milk and, and he started chatting and he thought, you know what? I should invite the guy for supper. And, and he said, I... I went to invite him for, for supper, you know, and he said, no, no, I can't really stay. And he drank a little bit of his milk. And, and he said, then the, the phone rang or something, and I got distracted, and I had, to, uh, I had to go get the phone. He said, I was only on the phone for a minute. He said, in the midst of all this, we're talking. And he says, I, as I gave the guy the glass of milk, he said something weird. He said, it sounded like he said, thank you, you've passed the test. And he said, I, I, I was sort of distracted. I thought, what did he say? And I thought, that's odd. But, you know, you get used to people saying odd things. And he just, he just, he just let it go, you know, just kept chatting away. And uh, he, he went and answered the phone. He come back. The guy's gone. The guy had a big yard and a very long driveway, and there were no houses nearby. He said it had only been a minute. He said, I stepped out on my deck. And he said, there was the milk sitting on the, on, the, on the railing. And he said, he was gone. He said, I looked around the, the yard real quick, and I looked down the laneway, and there was no sign of him. I never saw him again. He said, but to this day, he said, I believe it was an angel. Can you imagine? You ought to think about that. You know, we, we mentioned this last week, you know, about homeless people and and uh, yeah, you ought to think about that. Someday you'll be walking down the street. And I, I know, I get it. I get it. But wouldn't that be just like the Lord test you out? See if you have any compassion. You walk by and, and the Lord said, uh, Lord said to the angel, I want you to park right there and I'm going to see if sister so-and-so will. Now hear me. I don't think you ought to give him money. Did you hear me? You don't know if they're going to take it and spend it for booze or whatever. We used to encounter this up in northern Ontario. And, uh, boy, there was a lot of people that would were just in rough shape. And um, 
you'd walk by and they were they they'd be laying around out in front of the store and they they would ask for money and uh, you know I, I knew better than to give them money but I would do this I'd say uh, you know I I don't give out money but I'll buy you a sandwich and you could always tell the ones that were hungry because if they were hungry they'd say sure and if they weren't hungry they'd go oh okay that's when you knew they had something else in mind. I've often wondered if sometimes there's a handicapped person parked in a, in a wheelchair, you know, slobbering, looks like they're out of their mind, and a Christian walks by. And God says, let's see how they treat them. Let's see. Boy, wouldn't it be wild? Tomorrow morning, you're in traffic, and the Lord sends an angel, and the Lord says, cut him off. <laughs> See how he responds. You say, no. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't put it past the Lord for one minute. You know what the Lord's going to do? Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Because sometimes... They appear. Sometimes they appear. You know, this whole thing of your Christian life, it's a lot more than just doing a few of the right things and smiling and, and making a nice little social appearance. No, 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 no. It is all about a world we can't see. And in that world, God reigns. And God makes things appear. And God makes things disappear. And we walk by faith, not by sight. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. And you know, you and me are making progress when we learn more and more and more to live in that realm, conscious of that realm that we don't see. You know, sometimes you've got angels in your house. They just haven't appeared. The Bible does say, doesn't it say, He shall give His angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Lest thou, they shall bear thee up in their hands lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. I don't know if you know this or not. Several of you probably had. A, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him. You know what? Some of you were driving today and and you had angels around you. And uh, I, I, I'm usually a really good driver. And you can ask my wife this morning. I, uh, I, I didn't do so well a couple times. I wasn't cutting anybody off, but I was just, uh, I wasn't on the ball. And, um, you know, I don't think the angels get nervous. But if I had them on my front bumper, I think I made a couple of them nervous today. <laughs> I just about rear-ended somebody today. <laughs> and I went, Phew, thank you, Lord. They're going to be at your house tonight. They're going to be at your house tomorrow morning. Oh, the evil spirits will be there too. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The only difference is they're there. They just haven't appeared. God makes things appear. You used to have that little plaque, you know, people have in their house. Some of you probably have it. It says, Jesus Christ is the guest at this table. He is the listener to every conversation. And it's a cute little plaque. But I don't think hardly anybody that has that plaque on their wall really believes that. But it is true. And not only is He there, but angels are there. They're going to be at your house tonight. Let's pray. Lord, it is a blessed truth. It's wonderful. Lord, these things that, that you show us in your book. And Lord, we acknowledge them and we believe them. But Lord, so quickly do we forget them. Lord, 
Lord, would you help us by leaps and bounds to live with the consciousness of the unseen world and of the world that is to come. Lord, help us in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, the piano is going to play. And if God has spoken to you tonight, why don't you talk to Him? Lord, thank you for your book. Thank you, Lord, for your truth. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us tonight. God, help us, Lord. Help us this week. Lord, I pray it'd be a joyful week. I pray, Lord, it'd be a week, Lord, that we rejoice in thee. And God, where we bless thee. Lord, help us in Jesus' name.